Hey there, friends and foes. Good morning, Multiverse. This is Back of the Cereal Box. I am your host, the prophet of pop culture, John Pica. And this morning, we are going to be talking the Croft Super Show. Dave Mattingly is back with us this morning, and we've got a ton of new loot to show off. So this is going to be a super fun, super fast Saturday morning, and we're going to get to that right after this from the Murdering Crows. It's like Coca-Cola, Levi Strauss, Johnny Carson and Mickey Mouse. The first star was James Dean, Helmets Presley and he's still the king. Some things are only imitatable, you can't be that original. All right, friends and foes, we are back, and that theme song is courtesy of our great friends, The Murdering Crows, and you can get their album, Four Bad Crows, at Amazon, iTunes, Google, anywhere you buy music, and of course, this show is brought to you by our amazing Super Cereal Box friends, Eli Cash, Cindy Kep, Sharice Collins, Dave Maginelli, Dave Mattingly, Greg and Crystal Jones, and you too can have your name in lights at buymeacoffee.com slash cereal box pod. And the banner will be running along the bottom during the entire show. So you'll be reminded constantly to uh, support the show. Look, here's the fact of the matter. Broadcasting is getting more and more expensive. And you guys, by our audience support, you prevent us from having to... Uh, sell a bunch of advertising and get uh, tons of ads throughout the show. Nevertheless, uh, we are brought to you by <laughs> the Tales of the Decoverse series. This is my book series available at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and of course, our co-host Sarah's book, Every Beaten Path, also available from Amazon or your local bookstore, uh, wherever you buy books, go into the bookstore and ask them to get it. So, we got to ask the question right off the top of the bat. Where in the world is co-host Dee Barty? She is not with us this morning because she and her family are on vacation at Hilton Head Island. So uh, she's on the beach, sand between her toes, and uh, we see how she is. But fear not, true believer, because... Your emotional support Canadian, the Peppermint Princess, the social media socialite. She is a fan of X-Men, comic books, and all things superheroes. She is the one, the only Willow Skyler, and she is here with us as Good usual. morning. Good morning, Willow. <laughs> How are you this morning? Uh Waking up slowly, <laughs> but good. That's I got fantastic. my coffee, so I'm good. <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, hey, we got a surprise for everyone. Last week, at the spur of the moment, Willow and Kelly brought Dave Mattingly up to be a guest. And, you know, he's been reminding us in the chats of Dr. Shrinker for the last several weeks as we've been talking about the Croft shows. And this morning, we are going to be talking about Dr. Shrinker as part of the Croft Super Show. And so it was only appropriate to bring our Cereal Box Super friend, Dave Mattingly, on. He is a legit rocket scientist, former rocket scientist. He is a cybersecurity expert and maybe, maybe the smartest guy on the planet. He knows everything about everything he's amazing please welcome the one the only dave mattingly wow i got a whole like muppet introduction there thank you yeah. for uh yeah. tuning that the trumpet ah. hey i do my best that's my only 
that's my really only one true talent is introducing people. Um, anyway, you're very good at it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are super glad to have you with us this morning and, um, we've already got comments. So Drew Milden, who was with us again last week, live from, uh, Nerdy Gras says, good morning, cereal boxers. And if you guys did not see the live show from Nerdy Gras that we posted, um, Everyone had their doubts about French Toast Crunch cereal with bacon and syrup and milk. And I made everyone a believer. One, one, one guy in the audience said, this is the best breakfast I've ever eaten. It's going to be my regular breakfast food from now on. And another audience member said, man, this is so good. I wish I could take this home with me. And I was like, here you go. <laughs> take the box. Here's the bacon. Take the syrup. It was it was fantastic. So, uh, And if uh, you guys would like to send me a box of cereal <laughs> <laughs> to try. <laughs> well, for everyone who's tuning in for the first time, you're like, what are you talking about cereal? Well, we are called Back of the Cereal Box. And that is because we are a pop culture podcast that celebrates the fun of the Saturdays of our youth while surviving adulthood today. And for me and for Dave and for a lesser degree, Willow, Saturday mornings meant sitting down with big bowls of cereal, watching cartoons, reading comics, uh, Godzilla movies, kung fu movies, pro wrestling. And um, it, it, we're... You know, we didn't have smartphones or tablets at the breakfast table on Saturday mornings. So we were literally reading the back of the cereal box between cartoons, comics, kaiju, and kung fu movies. And that was like our newspaper. Right, Dave? That, that yeah. was, and, and Dave, you can re relate to this because I, I talk about this a lot. And people look at me like I have a third eye. They, they they would put comic books sometimes in the cereal box. There were toys that you would dig out. Yeah. Sometimes there were posters. There were toys. There were comic books. Sometimes they would print a game board on the back of the cereal box, and the game pieces were the prize in the box. Yeah. And the the like holy grail. Yeah, my favorite. Yes, the records. Yes, on the back of the box. Yes, you get your scissors. You cut out the box, kind of circle ish. <laughs> you know. As best you could. And there's could. A, a record. Put it on your tiny record player. It was a blast. Hey, yes. at one point, they even gave us games for computers. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yes. They, they put CD-ROMs in the boxes. That's right. That's right. And you know what? So, Dave, I was thinking about those cereal box records. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was a big hit that came off the cereal box. Is that the Archie's Sugar Sugar? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that came out on a uh, sugar crisp box. Yeah, I right. Oh, interesting. Honey, honey. Mm -hmm. Ooh, sugar, sugar, it's whatever. Sugar. I think I reversed that, but you got it. Yeah, you, you are my candy, candy girl. girl. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that that was a huge. Uh, yeah, I love those days. And you know what I'm thinking about doing, Dave? You know, we've been talking about doing more and more live show in front of an audience. I think we're going to start doing um, musical performances of cartoon theme songs and songs from uh, cartoons and from the those records. So um, now, live up performances. In, uh, I think May, uh, one of my local theater troops is going to be doing uh, Schoolhouse Rock. The oh, musical. I love that. Yeah. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Yeah. Lolly, lolly, get your adverbs here. All of that stuff. I can't yeah. wait. Oh yeah. man. You know what? You keep me tuned on that. I might come up there and join you uh in the audience for that. It would is be that, worthwhile. Yeah. Is is the, someone needs to record that for me? <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is not permitted by the rights of the musical, but um is that gonna be at Bardstown? In, in Louisville. Oh yeah, but but in the Bardstown Theater? Oh no, uh, the Bardstown no longer exists. It closed down uh New Year's Eve. Uh, I was there with them doing an improv thing to shut it down because the the landlord kept raising the rent. Nothing was fixed. Oh, my uh, gosh. I but love the plan that was to buy a new Bardstown, uh, which is going to be in an old church. Hmm. 
Uh, but then uh, about three weeks ago, the owner, Doug Schutz, died uh, very sadly. And at, at his, uh, his funeral service, oh, my gosh, the, the room was packed. The hallway outside was packed. There were people outside the funeral home because there wasn't room inside. Uh, standing ovation. Wow. It was a, a theater reunion for all the people, all the lives that he had touched in the 12, 13 years that he had that. Yeah, but, I've uh, but, I've uh, performed it. Yeah, the, the new Town. one is still going to take. Oh, we're getting a little bit of uh, freezing on wow, Dave's all, side. Uh, there you got go. frozen. We're spinning circles there for a little bit. Just you, Dave. Am I still on? Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we you're still you. here. Okay. And and that's a um, perfect segue for this comment. Because Andrew Milden says, as a cybersecurity specialist, I didn't think Dave would like records of anything. <laughs> well, music records on a record player, those are safe. Uh, a CD, I wouldn't want to risk anything like that. Interesting. All right. Because a well, CD that's... can have all kinds of malware. Because you put it on your computer often. Or you know, if you put it in a CD player, that's going to be all right. But... Uh, if a it was CD burnt, by itself could do anything. If it was burnt by some, you know, jerk well, no, selling uh, the knockoff, then yeah, I can see that. Well, no, a commercial CD could be laden with uh, yes, malware. Yep. Yeah. So hmm. the lesson this morning, kids, to survive adulthood is do not play your music CDs in your laptop computer. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> if they came out in the you know 90s CDs, they're probably safe. Gotcha. All right, so we're going to dive right into what's in the bowl. And um, I see, uh, Willow, you've got something in front of you. What's in the bowl this morning? It, it is my uh, cinnamon, uh, apple cinnamon Cheerios. Okay. <laughs> I bought a big box. You must have <laughs> the only one to eat. This is like four or five weeks now. That's great. Well, I bought the family a size box. It, was, it wasn't a box. It was a crate. You know. <laughs> well, look. If you're like me, I, I really, truly only eat cereal on Saturday mornings because the rest of the week I'm being a good boy to maintain my girlish figure, and um, I do eat Magic Spoon cereal, but that has like none of the bad stuff in it. So um, anyway, apple cinnamon Cheerios. What about you, Dave? You got anything this morning? Uh, no, this is my third event of the day already. Okay, I've already All had right. two breakfast meetings. Oh my gosh! You're, and you're... I do eat the the same thing every day to help maintain my blood sugar. It's uh, oatmeal with bananas. All right. All right. Um, well, I've got something to show off. This is one part what's in the bowl and one part new loot. So this week was National Cereal Day on March 12th. And to celebrate, we were sent this box. And this is, uh -oh. bring, bring me up center stage here, Willow. This is a VIP gift box. Wow. Cereal pop and uh, Cocoa Pebbles pop. It's Fruity Pebbles and Cocoa Pebbles cereal pop and a special bowl a bowl um with the fruity pebbles logo wow so i thought i'd do a live taste test so we're gonna start with the fruity pebbles cereal pop now you guys remember a couple of weeks ago we did the candy pop and the cookie pop so they loved our our review of that so much they sent us this box and um so i'm going to start with the fruity pebbles cereal pop and um this is just basically popcorn infused with the fruity pebbles mm -hmm. flakes huh. i've had the uh, cocoa pops uh popcorn and that's really good mm. Okay, this tastes just like Fruity Pebbles. 
I don't even taste the popcorn. Oh. Which I love Fruity Pebbles. Fruity Pebbles is like one of my top five favorite cereals. However, I don't like Fruity Pebbles plain. I need to have it in the milk. <laughs> so, and, and it's it's like this super sweet taste, right? When you eat it dry. So I don't know. I like this a lot because it tastes just like Fruity Pebbles, but maybe one or two, like half a handful is like my limit. However, the Cocoa Pebbles cereal pop, I cheated. I already <laughs> tried this yesterday. And let me tell you what, the Cocoa Pebbles cereal pop is unbelievable good. Not only does it have, you know, the Cocoa Pebbles pieces, but it also has this, like this, this mm, cream covering as well, like, like to simulate mm. milk. Like one of the uh, cereal bars. Mm-hmm. Amazing. The Cocoa Pebbles cereal pop is phenomenal. Excellent. I highly recommend both. Um, they are available. Uh, the Fruity Pebbles is... Of, they sent me a card to tell me where you can get them. Um, the Fruity Pebbles is available at Sands Club and Walmart. And uh, both the Cocoa Pebbles and Fruity Pebbles are available at Publix. So go out Good and get you some. Now, this week was a big week for New Loot, you guys. Um, so we got sent some cool swag. And um, one of them is a new comic series from Boink Comics called Serial. And... Um, so this episode is brought to you this morning by Boink Comics, serial issue number one. And um, this is about a rebellious food scientist named Tracy Colorado, who uh, she's trying to transform breakfast cereal and the breakfast cereal industry. And she starts having these visions of cereal box mascots getting viciously murdered and um it, it's really it's really funny because the whole story the whole story revolves around her really trying to fight back against the industry and she's literally trying to survive her adulthood today now the best part of the whole comic is actually the visions that she has which appear almost like, and you'll get this reference, Dave, they look like Sergio Aragonis cartoons. He, the artwork is very <laughs> stylized. Oh, man, kaboom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and there are, as part of this series, they created fake cereals. So <laughs> there's an ad for... Sugar Balls cereal, and um, the clown character is called what is his name? Um, it is called his name is uh, it's crunchy. Oh, doodah the clown, doodad, <laughs> doodad the clown, yeah. And then uh, there's an ad in the back or, or another vision that she's having of Captain with a spoon. <laughs> and really, really fun, really fun. Um, now I will I will warn you, this is is fun and it is exciting and it's um, you know it's a humor satire book, but um, it is not for kids. It is there there is some adult language, but like they created these other um, fake cereals like Holland Oats. Holland, yep. oats, honey <laughs> cluster crunch, and fortune cookie cereal, and um, yeah, yeah, it, it's just uh, it's a lot of fun. Check out cereal <laughs> cool. from Boink. 
comics. And then finally... And she's uh, having these visions of the serial mascots getting murdered. It's obviously yeah. the work of a... What? Andrew Serial Hazard. killer. Serial killer, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Then last but not least, uh, we have to acknowledge this, and we'll do a more full review next week, but this year is the 40th anniversary mm. of the L. Ron Hubbard classic Battlefield Earth. Now, for those of you who have seen the movie, don't judge the book by the movie. <laughs> this is considered a seminal science fiction work. And I was shocked, Dave, that you have never read this. No, I, I don't remember the book being that thick. What's that, like 500 pages? Oh, it's more like a thousand. Jeez. Oh, wow. 1,034. That uh, is crazy. Story. Um, yeah. Actually, there's there's uh, interviews in the back of it with L. Ron Hubbard. Um, a, an article from the Rocky Mountain News in February mm -hmm. 1983. There's some original poems. There's notes and annotations. I mean, it's a big... It's a big compendium. It's a big book. It yeah. tells the story, and then you can read the notes and the stories behind it. It's got this beautiful gatefold. It is a soft cover book, yeah. but it feels like a hardcover book. Um, and that's going to stand out in your shelf. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is this is considered by a lot of people to be the seminal science fiction novel of the 20, 20th century. Um but if you've only seen the movie, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> See, I, I'm going to have to go do a deep dive on L. Ron Hubbard because I don't understand how he went from writing just sci-fi novels or stories to <laughs> yeah. creating a whole religion. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think it was intentional. Quite honestly, I believe from reading what I've read from him that the religion was kind of created as part of his science fiction stories and kind of like how people latched on to H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu stories. They latched on to his Scientology and they made it a religion and he kind of went along for the ride. I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I suspect. But anyway, <laughs> Battlefield Earth, phenomenal book. And uh, I can't wait to get uh, Sarah's thoughts on it next week when she's back with us when we talk about Land of the Lost. Now, Dave, you got some new loot this week. Yeah. Show us what you got. So I wonder, at, uh, at Scientology, do they call their gatherings the Council of Elron? Oh, <laughs> that's so bad. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of new loot. Kroger had a sale on action figures. Ooh. Got those. Well, I want. I need that Moon Knight. I know. These are I have these, the Spider are Girl. Spiders. Are these the Titan series? Is that what it's called? The Titan series. Uh, yes, the uh, the Titan Hero series. Yeah, I love those. They're like what ten dollars normal price, normal retail ten dollars for the twelve inch figures. And yeah. they're remarkably good quality. They are. Black Panther. Man. Yep. <laughs> Cap. That's my secret oh, nice. cap. I love hungry. that. Yeah. And I got this uh, a little while back, but another really nice Moon Knight yeah. figure with the replaceable oh. hands and mask. Comes with a bunch of his own the crescent darts, things like that. And uh, America. America Chavez, yeah, yeah, very cool. And that's a part of Rintra. If you right. buy all of the pieces, then you can make your own Rintra. Cool by getting all of them. But this is just his torso bit. I hope we see more of that character. I wanted to see more of him in Multiverse of Madness, but yeah, I, I was disappointed that uh, we didn't get to hear him speak. Uh, but but at least uh, he was green, you know, yeah. and, and he was the Minotaur looking, so they, they got the look right. And not new loot, 
but something I will be using later on today uh, in my in the movie is my Lucha Libre mask. <laughs> El Pollo Loco, the mad chicken. All right, so you got to tell us about the movie, and then you got to model the mask. <laughs> well, uh, the movie uh, was originally called The Adventures of George. It's now going by Dark City. Uh, not the same one with Rufus Sewell, obviously. Yep. Might be some uh, problems with that title. But... Yeah, there would be some troubles, yes. Uh, I'm going to be a thug, and I'm going to take off the headphones and put you on speaker so you might get a little feedback for a little bit while I'm putting the mask on. Uh, I'm going to be uh, a, a group of thugs. There will be other luchadors there, uh, but, of course, uh, the costume department doesn't have to provide me with anything because I've already got my own. El Pollo nice. Loco, the fowl who is fair. <laughs> that's gonna be a lot of fun i so love after this that. after this i'm leaving a little early to go and see shazam uh then i've got a uh, a lunch date with the girlfriend uh which is new news and then uh tonight doing that so it's gonna be uh, a really fun day that's that's awesome i'm gonna see uh shazam 2 tomorrow night after watching my wife's production of peter pan Sweet. Okay. Yes. So super excited about that. Super excited about that. So um, you know what, Willow? Uh -huh. It's time to dive into our main topic. It's Saturday morning, 101. And we are in the middle of a series of talking about the Saturday morning essentials. Now, a lot of people might be asking, Johnny... Uh, you you've been on the Croft shows for a couple of weeks now, and and at the end of the day, it's going to be five weeks that we will have been talking about the Croft shows. Next week, we're going to end that the Croft seg segment of this series with the the best of the Croft shows, Land of the Lost. But we've talked about HR Puff and stuff, Lidsville. Sigmund and the Sea Monsters last week. And as Dave has reminded us week after week after week, his favorite <laughs> was Dr. Shrinker. And Dr. Shrinker, in his opinion, had the best theme song. But what we're talking about this morning is the Croft Super Show. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to bring up my Wikipedia pages here. Because the Croft Super Show was an hour-long show that um, basically packaged together uh, other shorts from the Croft creations. There were there were shorter shows, um, and it was hosted by this rock band, Captain Cool and the Kong. And can I just say that? That outfit with the the guy in the leopard print fedora and the I I need that costume. <laughs> I I want I want these costumes. I love I love Captain Cool in the Kong <clears throat> when when I was a kid. And you know what I did not know, Dave, is that the character in in between Captain Cool and um, oh I forget his name. Um, but the, the girl in the middle with the curly hair, that is the character of Nashville. But she was played by Louise Duarte. And I had no idea Louise Duarte was on this show. And she was one of my favorite comedians. And I actually got to share the stage with her um, uh, a couple of times. Had no wow. idea that she was a part of my childhood. Um, she's a great comedian, a great impersonate, uh, impressionist. She does a phenomenal uh, George Burns impersonation, of huh. all things. Huh. Yeah. She does a whole bit as George and Gracie. But anyway, Captain Cool and the Kong, they were the hosts of the Croft Super Show. They would do music num musical numbers to open the show, to, in between the different shows. And I believe, and Dave, you might know this, I believe that they did most of the theme songs for the shows themselves. And and they, 
I, I did not know this. They actually were all real musicians and they actually performed live. Um, there's a video of them doing concerts uh, at Six Flags in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, they, they put out a record. They put out an album. It was a whole thing. But the shows on the Croft Super Show included The Bugaloos, Electra Woman and Dinah Girl, Dr. Shrinker, Dr. Shrinker, Bigfoot and Wild Boy, Wonderbug, and the redheaded stepchild of all of them, Magic Mongo. <laughs> That was oh, pretty and, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and I did forget. Um, did I not load it up here? The Lost Saucer. The Lost Saucer. I don't so, remember that uh, one. Yeah, so uh, let me see if I can get this image up. So, Willow. Yes, sir. So, the homework this week was just... I, I sent the link to the all of the intros. All of the show's intros. Um, and then... I just gave you loose instructions to just kind of follow your nose down the down the rabbit hole of the Croft Super Show. So what were your first impressions? And did you uh, did you do any further research? Did you watch? I, I watched episodes? I watched a show. <laughs> um, you know, it's very colorful, um, uh, although. Okay, going back to uh, the picture of the, the group. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, it was Huggy Bear's costume uh, inspired by the pimp costume at all? Because that looks very much like uh, what uh, Snoop Dogg wore. And <laughs> well, so it's funny. Those costumes are especially inspired by the pop band abba yeah this is what abba was wearing and well, i thought it was more uh, glam rock like uh, t-rex and gary glitter and those folks well wasn't that a little bit later though this would have been 1973 yeah that the uh, glam rock was kind of in its infancy but i i think that they, they were partly inspired by that movement okay and i know that over the seasons captain cool and the kongs did change their look a bit yes yeah, um, and and the the show itself ran uh, only two seasons on Saturday morning, and then it was repackaged for um, weekday syndication as the Croft Superstars, and that's how I remember it, because I was I was three years old when it was on on Saturday mornings, but it would run in syndication until 1978, and that's how I remember these shows. Um, and, and so e funny. either they were very inspired by Starsky and Hutch around that time, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, the guy on the left does look very Eric Estrada, doesn't he? Yeah, well, you know that was that was just the fashion of the day. I mean, the pop fashion of the day. Yeah. You had ABBA, you had the Glary Gitter glitters, you had Earth, Wind, and Fire, Kiss to some mm -hmm. degree. You know, wearing these outlandish, outrageous costumes, and. Um, you know, I, I personally, I I think it's fantastic, and you know, and the leader very much sounded like John Travolta in Greece. Well, so and all of that is intentional, Willow. See, as as we work our way down through this list, none of these shows are exactly original in concept. Like, let's talk about the Bugaloos. The Bugaloos were a band of fairies. And again, they were all real musicians, real singers and, and instrumentalists. And they, um, they had this band in, in their, their uh, what was the fairyland called? I forget. But, um, and they would play musical numbers. And this show, when they were casting it in the UK, was touted as the British Monkeys. So it was inspired by the monkeys, which was inspired by the Beatles. And the first monkeys knockoff that the Croft brothers did 
was the banana splits. Mm -hmm. But they they created um, the Bugaloos, and I still remember the theme song. The Bugaloos, the Bugaloos, we're in the air and everywhere, flying high, flying free, flying free as a summer breeze. Uh, yeah, in I, I've sung that song all my life, and <laughs> I, I've remembered it since I was a child. But um, Willow, the standout star of this show, was the legendary comedian Martha Ray as Benita Bazaar. <laughs> and that was kind of the uh, the signature of these Croft shows, wasn't it, Dave? That the villains were really the most memorable characters. Yeah. I mean, with Lidsville, you know, uh, C, Charles, Charles Wilson, Wilson Riley. Riley. Yeah. And, and with uh, uh, Puff and Stuff, Witchy Poo, Billy Hayes, the, they, they were the over, and Martha Ray was the same way. Now, does anyone remember what else Martha Ray was super famous for? I do not. She did the denture commercials, the <laughs> poly dent denture commercials. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and she was also a regular. Th there's a theme here. She was also a regular on the Gong Show mm. and Hollywood Squares. So, yeah. um, Martha Ray as Benita, and the whole plot, Willow, was Benita Bazaar thought that she could be a big super pop star and be a superstar, and she just needed the right band to back her up. And she hears the Bugaloos playing the music, and she goes and she asks them to be her backup band. They refuse, and so like every supervillain does, she kidnaps them and forces them to play on her record. Huh. Dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> and that's how we all got our start, was getting kidnapped by a villain and forced to do jobs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you're wrong, Dave. I, I think there's some truth in that. And then, but, um, but go I ahead. do have a couple of uh, costumes uh, to show off here, if Ooh. I may. Okay. Do you know how to share your screen? I'm going to try. So, Brad. There we are. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Speaking of uh, a captain with a spoon. Oh, there's your <laughs> Captain yep. Crunch. Captain Crunch. Crunch. This was uh, my my first costume I ever made by myself back in the 80s. All right. Awesome. That is really well done. Thank you. What'd you make that hat out of? Uh, a poster board. Wow. Yep. And uh, since we're going to be talking about Dr. Shrinker, here's my mini me. <laughs> Dr. Shr yeah. Nice. So Brad Parnell says the Bugaloos was the second show by the Crofts back in 70, 72. It wasn't part of the original Croft Super Show, but it was in the reruns you mentioned. None of the research I did supports that statement, Brad. Um, every Everything that I found has it connected with the second season of the Croft Super Show. We So... Um, I'll have to dig a little bit um, deeper, and and same with the Lost Saucer. Every reference has it uh, premiering on the Croft Super Show. So I'm not going to say you're wrong, but anyway. Um, yeah, I, uh, like I said I don't remember Lost Saucer, but I do remember Far Out Space Nuts. Yeah, Far Out Space Nuts was kind of side by side. Yeah, um, and. Also on the Croft Super Show was Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. We did a whole episode about them uh, in our first or second season. Uh, Electra Woman was played by Deidre Hall, and they were kind of the female equivalent to Batman and Robin, and definite heavy inspiration off Batman and Robin and the Wonder Woman phenomenon that was on cbs television um a little bit of the uh charlie's angels vibe with their um their chief who would send them on missions and uh 
I always loved this show, Dave. This was mm-hmm. one of my favorite Saturday morning shows. Yeah. And do you remember who did the theme song? Let the woman and dine a girl I fighting the song. all I don't evil who did deeds. It. Cindy Lauper. Wow. Really? Yeah. Huh. That amazes me. Yeah. Because this was, what, six, seven years before She's So Unusual came out? Yeah. Well, longer than that. This was like 1973. Okay. 72, I'll, I'll say, 73. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That was the only the first season. That's right. So 10 years, probably. Yeah. So before Cindy Lauper was Cindy Lauper, she did the theme song and she wrote it, wrote it and performed it. Oh, wow. And um, she was uh, famous for doing it live in concert at her concerts. Mm. And there's a there's a performance of her doing it just uh, like a year or two ago in a live concert. Cool. I've yeah. never seen her in concert. I'm, I'm very sad. Even sadder now. She, listen, she she sounds great. She looks great. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I swear she's discovered the fountain of youth. <laughs> she doesn't look like she's aged a day. I, I don't mm-hmm. know how she's done that, but love Cindy Lauper. All right. Also part of the Croft Super Show was Dave's favorite. Dr. Shrinker, Dr. Shrinker. And Dave, you have said that you felt like this had the best theme song of all of them. Yeah, Electro and Dinah Girl has a good theme song, but this is the one that always stuck with me. Yeah, all of them on the Croft Super Show had a really good theme song. Um, and, and I would put that up there, but you know, I didn't like this show, Dave. I, Dr. Shrinker scared me Mm. and I did not like watching this because look, this guy looks like an evil (laughs) deranged mad scientist. It looks like Vincent Price's cousin. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he looks like something out of a hammer horror movie, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely the vibe they were going for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I never really understood the point of the show. He shrunk the three teenagers and he shrunk them and was trying to catch them. And then that was every episode. I chase the shrinkies and fail. I chase the shrinkies and fail. What does it all mean? That was uh, in a way this was the inspiration for the Smurfs. Yes, it was. Because he is definitely Gargamel. Yeah. <laughs> and Billy Barty played his assistant. And Billy Barty was the Azriel mm-hmm. to Dr. Shrinker. Yep. And, and um, Billy Barty was uh, also the cameraman in UHF, which is yes. fantastic. I love that one. And he's been in tons of things. Yep. But yep. Dr. Shrinker and UHF are the two things that I remember him the most for. See, I loved Billy Barty in um, in Willow, and um, he was also uh, uh, the the wizard that replaced the part of Orko in the Masters of the Universe movie. Mm, okay. um, I think he was called Grin- Grindolf. Um, but I'll tell you, I- I've Doctor Shrinker. And his assistant, played by Billy Barty, freaked me out as a kid. <laughs> and is it my imagination, or did Billy Barty always look like an old man? <laughs> he Even always when looked he was pretty a young old. man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he yeah. was born in 1932 and lived until 2002. And always, always looked the same. All right. This was yeah, my I, favorite. I think his high school picture, he probably could have cast for a, a teacher, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. So, Willow, out of those three that we've talked about, did you watch any episodes of those? Oh, uh, I... Just what I saw uh, from the Super Show. Um, yeah, I... Well, I'm, I'm going to... I can't s- say which one is my favorite because they all just kind of had a... It, they, they all... 
I, I'm not a huge fan of these kid shows. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> well, they they were all cat. They were all really designed to capitalize on more popular trends of the day. Yeah, I, I love Sid and Marty Croft stuff, but they really didn't create a lot of truly original concepts. Um, and you're going to see that more in just a moment because one of the biggest episodes on television in the 70s was the Six Million Dollar Man two-part episode with Bigfoot. And Sid and Marty Croft were like, ooh, Bigfoot. And they created Bigfoot <laughs> and Wild Boy, mm -hmm. which I was absolutely over the moon about this show when I was a kid. Okay, I, that Bigfoot costume is actually well done, I will have to say. Really well done. And when you watch when you watch the show, you, I, you really can't tell it's a costume. It's it's spooky good. Yeah, it was uh, made from human hair. Uh, oh, by wow. Master Wigmaker. Was it really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, the six million dollar man, uh Bigfoot, you know who played that one? Yeah, it was Andre the Giant. And apparently, um, let me see if I can bring it up here. Uh, the actor that played Bigfoot in this was an Olympic high jumper. Both both of the actors were um, uh, uh, athletes. And this was the first, first and last shows they ever did. Ray Young played Bigfoot. He was an Olympic high jumper. Joseph Butcher was wild boy. And he was a uh, decathlete, uh, a hurdle <clears throat> wow. runner. And you you remember, yeah, they did get their own show, uh, that comment. Uh, who was yeah. that that commented? Was Brad Parnell. Brad, Brad Brad, yeah. Parnell. They did get their own show. So there were 12 episodes on the Croft Super Show. And then they got another, uh, I want to say 14 episodes of their own show in um, 1979. Um, and uh, yeah, so the original Croft Super Show uh, episodes were in 1977. Then in 1979, they got their own show. And listen, I loved Bigfoot and Wild Boy. And I really, really, really wanted to be Wild Boy. So the whole theme of this show, <laughs> um, Willow, was that Wild Boy was a, a lost child that Bigfoot found and became like a foster parent and raised him. And strangely enough, Wild Boy could speak perfect English and could speak Bigfoot ease. So it was, uh, sorry, I almost said George of the Jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for that tree. Tarzan. <laughs> it had a very Tarzan-esque feeling, but it was all to capitalize on the popularity of that $6 million man Bigfoot episode. And actually going back to your $6 million, uh, two actors played Bigfoot. The other one was Lurch, Ted Cassidy. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Interesting. We're learning so much this morning. Also part of the Croft Super Show was The Lost Saucer, starring Jim Neighbors and Ruth Buzzy. And basically, you guys, this was Lost in Space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, these two were from, an, they were like cyborg aliens who crash landed on Earth and they kidnapped this little boy and his babysitter. And look, the bridge of the saucer is almost identical That's to very the Lost Jupiter in Space. Yeah. yeah. And the design of the saucer was definitely Jupiter 2. And I, I, I wouldn't be shocked, actually, if the Crofts were sued by the producers <laughs> of Lost in Space. Because it was so remarkably similar. The the chess pieces are like the chess pieces on on the robot. Uh, the robot. Yeah. I mean, they're just I mean, guys, come on. <laughs> 
And this was actually my least favorite of the show. And again, Ruth Buzzy, um, she was a comedian, again, well known for her appearances on Hollywood Squares and The Gong Show. Uh, she was my first crush, I'll tell you. Was she really? Yes. You know, I watched an episode of this this week because I, I couldn't remember if Jim Neighbors, you know, changed his accent or not. And he did not. He had that Gomer Pyle accent. Mm. And, uh, well, we're just on a lost saucer floating through space. And uh, it really took me out of the whole I'll environment. <laughs> Shazam. Yeah. So, um, and then, uh, 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 Dave, do you remember Wonderbug? Vaguely. So, Wonderbug... There, there were a number of cartoons that did similar things. Speed Buggy yes. and stuff like that. And I, yes. I vaguely remember Wonderbug. Yeah, so, again, very similar to Speed Buggy. And, and they came out at the same time. Yeah. And so, I'm sure a lot of people would confuse the two, but... And Herbie the Love Bug was what, late 60s? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Herbie had, what, three, four movies, I guess? Yeah, and, and again, yes, you're absolutely right. Inspired by Herbie, and I'm sure Speed Buggy was inspired by Herbie, too. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept here was this, this junkyard heap of a car called Schlepp. When they would they... I think they honked a magic horn, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like Frosty the Snowman. When they honked <laughs> the magic horn, it turned into this super human anthropomorphic car, Wonderbug, yeah. which was super fast and could fly yep. through the air. A bit like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang that was yes. written by, do you know? Uh, no, I don't. Ian Fleming. Ah! Chitty Chitty James Bang Bond. Bang is the same universe as James Bond, potentially. I love that. I love that. Well, so here's here's a fun trivia about Wonderbug. Um, the the junk heap car schlep was actually sturdier and better built than the supercar. <laughs> I believe it. The actor said that they had to be so careful. Uh, when they were on this prop, not to break it. Mm -hmm. But the 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 junkyard car was like sturdy as a rock. Well, that's because they couldn't afford George Barris. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to take off, folks. I've got to right. head out, see Suzanne, and then all the rest of my fun day. So I'll catch you guys on the next box. All right, thank you for joining us, Dave. It's been a lot of fun. Everybody follow you, Dave. Dave at DaveMattingly.net, and uh, we'll see him around at shows this summer and catch on the back of the yeah. cereal Next box. week, I'll be at Lexington Comic Con, so we'll see a bunch of folks there. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. All right, Willow, we got to talk about one last show on the Croft Super Show. Okay. This one I had completely forgotten about until... I started taking a deep dive, and that was Magic Mongo. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> he was a genie that they found in a bottle washed up on a beach. Now, in the opening credits, they're playing volleyball, and the ball gets hit out of bounds and the guy goes to run to get the ball and the ball has landed beside this old bottle and instead of grabbing the volleyball to continue the game he decides oh there's this old bottle i'm gonna grab that instead and show everybody what i found on the beach how unrealistic is that forget the <laughs> fact that it's a genie's bottle and magic mongo is a genie that you know wiggles his ears physically to make magic happen he, he decides, rather than continuing the game of volleyball with his beautiful friends, to pick up this old, nasty bottle on the beach 
Clearly like, not was, the smart one of the group. <laughs> no. No. And Magic Mongo was a just a goofy genie. And here's what really disappointed me. They had such potential to actually use real magical effects, a real magician to do, to re... But instead they used, you know, camera cuts and, you know, cheap special effects. That, that show could have been something really special, but instead it is on the... Uh, the heap of forgotten shows. So Brad Parnell says, Lenny Weinreb, who played Magic Mondo, Mongo, was a prolific voice actor and was also the voice of Puffin Stuff. Ah, okay. All right. I did not know that. He, he also said that Ruth Buzzy was great on Laughing. Yeah, I'd forgotten she was on Laughing as well, along with uh, Goldie Hawn. And uh, some other great, great classics. Yeah, Ruth Buzzy was um, a super, super funny uh, person. And um, she's probably rolling over in her grave that we're talking about her appearances on The Lost Saucer. I don't she know. Didn't so, like that. She didn't like being on that show? Well, or? so here's, here's, here's the thing. So for a lot of these actors... They had fun on the Croft Super Show, but it was also nearly the death of their careers. Mm. Um, like, a little bit of trivia. Phil Collins auditioned to be the, the grasshopper bugaloo, the, the blonde. Oh, wow. And he didn't get the part. And he later said, thank God I did not get cast in that show. Because these musicians never went on to do anything else. And um, the uh, the uh, character played by uh, character of Joy, who was played by Caroline Ellis. And Caroline Ellis was a uh, uh, you know, singer, dancer. She was a brilliant uh, ballet dancer. Really never did anything else of consequence now that having been said there was a comment from brad about captain cool the guy who played captain cool i i mentioned joyce dewitt who's in or not joyce dewitt uh louise duart in the green captain cool was played by michael lembeck who was the son of harvey lembeck who was eric von ripper in the beach parties but michael lembeck would go on to have a career in soap operas so, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some some of these folks had careers beyond the Sid and Marty Croft Super Show. Like, and most of them were the people who played the villains, like Martha Ray and Billy Barty. But um, a lot of these people, you know, never did anything else after this. This was their first and last credit. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I picked this show as part of our Saturday morning 101 as an essential because I think it's important for people to be familiar with the Croft Super Show to really understand how trippy the 1970s really was. Because yeah. these shows set the stage for things that were to come later. Um, Sid and Marty Croft set the table for the Muppet show to have the popularity that it had. Um, you know, Sid and Marty Croft really revolutionized a lot of techniques that would be um, advanced in other shows and TV and movies, special effects and whatnot. They came up with the original uh, ways to do them and then other filmmakers enhanced them and improved them. Yeah. So, and and they gave us some great Saturday morning villains. One of the things I was always super disappointed about, and if there's anyone else watching and you can raise your hand, I was always super disappointed that Electra Woman and Dina Girl never teamed up with Bigfoot and Wild Boy. This was a team up waiting to happen dying to happen and it never happened and uh, i was always super disappointed and I i'll tell you 
they've tried to restart the Electric Woman and Dino Girl franchise two other times. There was a TV movie with Marky Post playing Electric Woman, and then there was a an Amazon Prime movie that came out mm, three or four years ago that um, really went nowhere. Wait, but, Marky um, Post, it, it, was that before her Night Court days? Mm-hmm. Yep. But she was already a star before she even came on Night Court. But um, anyway, anyway, um, Croft Super Show, it is a piece of 70s nostalgia that I think is definitely <laughs> I love that you essential. said that nicely. <laughs> so I, this I did not know. Um, that the music of the Kongs was actually written by the Osmonds. I didn't know that, and I, I didn't find that in my research, Brad. You're you're giving me some stuff that I'm gonna have to go uh, take even deeper dives on. I don't. I think the Wikipedia entries are not quite uh, up to date. But you know what? Now that you say it, it sounds like something the Osmonds would have written. Um, and Brad agrees. It was a blast being a kid in the '70s, and Sid and Marty's shows were a huge part of that. That's exactly the reason I have spent so much time talking about the Sid and Marty Croft shows. And that's why next week we're going to talk about what I consider the absolute best of all of them. And that is land of the lost. And Willow. See, part of me wishes I lived through that with you guys. I, I, I was born in the early eighties and got to experience it, but being up in Canada, I had like all these other uh, TV kitty shows that it to live through and i'll touch on that later on but uh one of them is uh sharon lois and bram which who had you know dance uh, dance with the giant elephant so clearly that was very reminiscent of the croft uh yeah. creators yeah and and look you know it, it shaped a lot of what was to come and you know like dave said Dr. Shrinker was basically the Smurfs before the Smurfs. Um, and uh, you see the influence of the Crofts in everything after. And um, I, so, uh, yeah, I, I just I, I love what they did and what they were still doing as late as 2019. So, um, by the way, I went and I watched that updated rebooted version of Sigmund and the uh -oh. Sea Monsters uh -oh. on Amazon Prime. Not a bad show. Definitely a kid show. Mm -hmm. um, definitely kept the spirit of the original Sigmund and the Sea Monsters um, and uh, was a lot of fun, but definitely written for kids. Yeah. So, Willow, your assignment next week <laughs> is to watch Land of the Lost. Okay. From the 70s. It is on YouTube and you're going to love it. It, it okay. really was outstanding. And when when you watch Land of the Lost, you are going to see the foundations for so many other things that came after. Uh the stop motion photography, the animation that they did with the dinosaurs, the puppetry, the costuming. They took a giant leap from silly kid show to serious high stakes family drama. And uh, I think you're going to really like it and really dig it. Okay. Um, so uh, all of those of you watching, that's your assignment as well. Uh, check out Land of the Lost and then join us back here next week uh, when we'll uh, talk about it. And that will end our segment our series on the Sid, Sid and Marty Croft, and we'll get back to traditional animation. <laughs> but I hope you've enjoyed this trip back in time. I, I, you know what I did because I liked seeing what, you know, what other shows were inspired by. Um, I love, I love costumes as, uh, as a cosplayer. And I like, um, I like just seeing what other people grew up with because uh, it, kind of gives me a look into other people's childhoods. I mean, like I've had a Canada, a Canadian television as boring as it is now. 
<laughs> we had some really good stuff. Uh, it, it drained, it drained my, it drained my childhood and it's stuff like that, that it like shows like, um, Mr. Rogers has inspired shows like Mr. Dress Up and uh, Ernie Combs actually worked with, uh, Mr. Rogers. So, <laughs> you know what we, after we finish the Saturday morning 101 series, I do want to come and talk about Canadian TV because Mr. Dress Up is such a huge phenomenon in Canada. And I, I, I don't think people understand what a big thing. There's a reason why I'm a cosplayer. He was the reason why I became a cosplayer because the, the whole idea of having a trunk full of costumes and playing dress up as yeah. an adult. <laughs> yeah. And, and he was, he was in his late fifties, maybe sixties when he was doing that. Yeah. Um, today, you know, some people might frown on that, but, um, and we had, a, we had the friendly giant, you know, things like that. Yeah. We're going to do a whole series on Canadian, uh, Saturday mornings just for you. And, uh, one last comment from Brad Parnell, my favorite costume, costumes of theirs talking about the crop brothers were the banana splits which they made for hanna barbera before they started doing their own shows that's right and by the way did you realize that um on uh, you know on almost all of these sid and marty croft shows the characters were uh you know they were produced by the croft brothers but a lot of the characters in a lot of shows were actually created by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, who were responsible for so many more of the Saturday morning cartoons that we're going to talk about in the next segment of Saturday Morning 101, Ruby Spears cartoons. They did Fang Face, they did uh, Thundar the Barbarian, they did so many others that we're going to get into. But um, it's, it's so funny how the the cartoon universes the saturday morning universes are so closely knit between the crofts ruby spears hanna barbera and um yeah yeah we're going to get into more of that brad thank you for joining us and adding to the conversation we really appreciate it and please make sure you come back now before we leave willow people need to follow you <laughs> at willow skyler you're all over social media, I on am. all the platforms, and you did something kind of fun on your TikTok this week. Um, what what was that? Uh, I, remind I, me. <laughs> I, I went out and bought a whole bunch of Garbage Pail Kids uh, comic or play uh, cards. Cards, yeah. <laughs> reliving my childhood <laughs> through nostalgia. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, although they don't have the gum uh, like they had back in the eighties, uh, but which yeah, is it's... criminal. <laughs> oh, uh, these are I like will be I, I will be getting a binder full of, uh, for these cards later. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the. Um, now you told me how much you spent on these. And I was just like, Willow, Willow, <laughs> what are you doing? This is why you don't give nerds money, because we will spend hundreds of dollars just to reconnect with our childhood. <laughs> Garbage Pail Kids have made a huge comeback. And you know what? I was never a fan of Garbage Pail Kids. I, they disgusted me when I was a kid. I was, I was one of those kids. I was not into that bodily fluid humor. And... um so I never liked Garbage Pail Kids. I didn't like Cabbage Patch Kids either. They creeped me out. But um, Garbage Pail Kids disgusted me. And but you were a fan. I was a fan. And like I loved, I loved the Mad Balls that came out. Those were uh -huh. really cool. I loved Garbage Pail Kids. Uh, there was uh, like around the time that uh, uh, Gremlins came out, there were these uh, puppets that came it came out around the same time and for the life of me i can't remember what they're called but i but if i can find the picture in the cage 
Yeah. The, 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 yeah. The monster. Pu yes. Oh my gosh. I remember those. I love those. I can't remember what those <laughs> are called either. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. But if I can find the picture uh, of uh, my mom making one of them uh, smoke her cigarette, <laughs> it was funny at the time. Uh, so, I I've got to know, though, how many Garbage Pail Kid packs did you buy? Did you, like, buy a whole case? Uh, uh, well, I bought what they had on the shelf. <laughs> Oh my God! So three three big boxes and one of the smaller ones. So a hundred and twenty dollars later. Oh <laughs> I love it. I love it. But and they're all going in a binder. They're all going into a binder. I have other comic cards that I've collected. Uh, I have the uh, Marvel uh, Women of Marvel uh, cards. Okay. Uh, and uh, back in ninety. Five, I believe the, they came out with uh, Marvel trading cards, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've, I've that's got a actually bunch of them too. <laughs> that's... I've got a complete set of the A Team TV show trading cards, uh, and in a binder, I've got a complete set of the Phantom movie trading cards and a complete set of the Rocketeer trading cards. Oh wow! Yes, and maybe oh, and the Dick Tracy movie trading cards oh yeah Complete yeah sets yeah yeah i, I remember uh, them bringing out uh, like sticker books as well uh, like mm -hmm. one of my favorites uh, of the sticker books was uh was the trolls <laughs> okay oh the the fuzzy headed troll yeah the troll dolls on. yeah um that's that's a lot you know what? Uh, we're gonna have to grab some of those <laughs> we're gonna have to find some of those and show off some of these now the one regret i have is that i had a complete set of the original Star Wars cards by Tops. Okay. I whole thing. And I regret that I sold them in a yard sale. Mm. Um, got a lot of money for them, but I wish I still had them today. So that's the lesson for all of you kids watching. Before you sell collectibles that bring you joy, just think of how you're going to feel 10, 15, 20 years later when you wish that you still oh had it. i there there are like i had a i had a pretty big barbie collection and uh i actually had the gem car from okay. gem and the holograms oh really? and uh i i gave the car up along with my barbie collection to some kids that i felt needed to remain kids at the time gotcha and uh, yeah, let's put it to you this way: two hundred dollars for the gem car to have it back. Not in, in not exactly my thing that I want to spend money on. But next Saturday eBay is dangerous. Yes, <laughs> next Saturday, the twenty fifth, Gem herself, Samantha Newark, is going to be here in Gallatin, where I live, at Town Square, Town Square Records and Comics. Um, signing autographs and meeting fans. And she's got a brand new album, a brand new record that is releasing next Saturday. And uh, I'll be able to get a, a first printing copy of it. So uh, if you're in the middle Tennessee area, come out and see Samantha Newark at Town Square Records and Comics. And uh, with that, we need to go because I got to go to the bank. I got to go to the comic book shop. I got to get all that done before my wife needs the car. So hope you guys enjoyed the show. Continue to post comments down below. If you like the show, share it with two, 300 of your closest friends and family, whatever platform you're watching or listening, subscribe, follow the show. And um, until the next time. Oh, I forgot. You got to also become a supporter. Yep. Keep us ad free as long as we can be at buymeacoffee.com slash cereal box pod. Uh, to keep us ad free, we depend on audience members like you. Buymeacoffee.com at cereal box pod. You can donate $2, $5, $10 a month. Buy us a bowl of cereal. Buy us the whole box and uh, help us improve our show. And if you hate the show, donate even more generously to help us improve even more. And 
With that, Willow, we will say farewell, so long, farewell, I'll be the same bonjour. And until the next time, love you, mean it. We'll catch you on the back of the cereal box. Bye. Bye.